morning, One Chapel. I'm so excited you're able to join us online this Sunday morning. I want to encourage you to press in to the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning as we worship together. So let's sing this out. You are good. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love. You are love. On display for all to see. You are light. You are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope. You are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace. You are peace. You are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true. You are true. Even in my wandering, you are joy. You are joy. You are the reason that I sing. You are life. You are life. And your death is lost its sting. Hello, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever rain. Come on, sing you a more.
You quiet my soul. You quiet my soul when you walk in the room. Mm. Oh Lord, we're confident that we'll see you move. Every imperfection made perfect in you. You come. Change who I am. To、so、change. 
Good morning, One Chapel. Welcome to church. If you're new to One Chapel, take a moment and fill out a connection card. You can click the link in the chat or scan the QR code. And you can always visit our five minute party right after service. This is a great chance to meet our pastors, leaders, and find out how to become connected. If you visit the five minute party, we have a small gift for you. It's really not that big of a deal. It's just 
the One Chapel Coffee Mug. This week begins our 21 days of prayer. We believe prayer has to be the center of our lives as believers. And there's something powerful that happens when the whole church sets aside time to pray together. Each week, we will have a different time to pray from Monday through Friday. Week one is at 6.30 a.m. Week two, we'll have a noon prayer meeting. And then week three, we'll have an evening prayer meeting at 7 p.m. It starts with 6.30 a.m. prayer meetings Monday through Friday this week. We want everyone to attend. Attend at your campus as much as you can. And when you can't make it, join us online on Facebook, YouTube, or OneChapel.com. Let's gather together and pray as a church family. We'll see you tomorrow morning at your campus. Your giving is important to us at One Chapel. It helps us provide church services, student ministry, and your giving impacts missions locally and around the world. If this is your home church, we invite you to partner with us and give. We are able to serve so many because of your generosity. To give or to set up monthly giving, simply scan the QR code or go to onechapel.com backslash giving. Are you ready to pray? Ready to study the scripture? Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word and how it gives us life and light and how it enters us and then it changes everything. And then you give us the strength and the grace to obey you. So Lord, have your way in us today. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our church. Have your way in our city. Help us to see the big picture of what you're doing all over our world and help us not to miss it today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you wanna follow along with the message notes, you can check out uh, the QR code on the back of your seat. I think they can put it up here, there it is. Uh, it's also an awesome place to give if you wanna give. Uh, tithes and offerings are so important for all of us. Check that out and follow along with us. Here's, here's a sentence that you, many of you already know at One Chapel. It's kind of been our, our motto for a while. It's been a, a mission statement, maybe, maybe a vision statement. It starts with the word helping. Can you say it with me? Helping people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. You know what that means? That means no matter where you are in your journey, in your spiritual journey, God has more for you and me. That whether we're older or younger in our faith, that there's more. It doesn't matter if you're the oldest, crustiest believer in the room. You still got more to experience of God because he is infinite. He is creator of all things. He, there's more of him that he wants to share with you and me. And if you're brand new to faith, if you're just, maybe you're just still trying to check out the claims of Jesus, I'm telling you, God is calling you on a journey with him. And he has so much for you. I love this phrase. It means, it means we're all moving. Everybody say moving. We're not static, we're not staying still. And this idea of moving is really important because so often, you know, if you, if you think about spiritually how you need to move, like sometimes that, that's an important concept that we don't really wrap our heads around, but it's just like when you're physically moving or if you physically stop moving, what happens? When you stop moving physically, you get weak. If you don't keep working out, if you don't keep running, if you don't keep doing something that creates resistance, there it is, there's the word, resistance, then your muscles start to atrophy and you get weak, but it gets worse than that. You know what else happens? When you get weak, then you get lazy. You lose your motivation to even work out. That's what people tell me. I've never experienced that myself, but... 
It's just like that spiritually. If you don't move spiritually, you'll get weak. You'll get weak, you'll get lazy. You won't even wanna pray anymore. It's part of the reason for 21 days of prayer. Get ourselves into, back into the habit. What it means when you move forward is there's seasons. Seasons of growth, seasons of loss, seasons of plenty, and seasons of perseverance. It means you will go from season to season to season because you're moving forward. And that means, that means a very difficult word for everyone to accept. That means change. Come on, everybody say it. Change. Change. Everybody, listen, I love this phrase. Everybody wants something new, but nobody wants to change. What is that? Change is hard. Yes, it's insanity. Change is hard. Transitions can be painful. Perseverance is so difficult. But you can't resist change. If you resist change, you'll be in trouble. Don't avoid it. Don't complain about it. Don't even just tolerate it. Don't tolerate change. All right, I'll just go along. No, you've got to embrace it. If you don't change, you can't grow. If you can't grow, you can't produce fruit. If you can't produce fruit, you'll die, spiritually speaking, and I think in, in other ways as well. Rosabeth Moss Cantor is the, a professor at Harvard Business School, and she's the former chief editor of the Harvard Business Review, and she says leadership is about change. Leadership is about change. But resistance manifests itself so, in so many ways when you try to get people to change. Yeah. And my opinion is we are in the midst of a massive change in our culture, a massive change in our world. I think there's a massive change going on in the church, Big C Church, spiritually in our country. We are in the midst of, a, of upheaval. And I think there is a sense at which you want to resist and I think going through the pandemic we all kind of wanted to go back to what was but we're never gonna be able to go back. You gotta go forward. Yeah. And, people, and people don't realize that and, and, and um, Britt Hancock who's sitting on the front row here did an awesome message about that. I encourage you to go back and listen to that because I think there's something so significant about where we are in our season the season of one chapel, the season of our country, the season of our city. And um, this, this lady, Ro Rosabeth Moss Cantor, she lists 10 reasons people resist change. You wanna hear what they are? I'm sure you'll identify with them. The first one is loss of control. Any control freaks in the room? Every one of you should lift your hands. Nobody likes to lose control. Leaders have to deal with the fact that when changes happen, you've got to help people find some ways to make choices. The second one is excess, uh, excess uncertainty. <laughs> I love this. I love how she says excess uncertainty. The very words acknowledge that there is uncertainty that you just have to deal with. We all have to deal with it. There's the third one. The third reason is she calls it surprise, surprise. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, welcome to life. Like, in a way, we shouldn't be surprised, you know? It's like, um, but, but making sure that, that people will follow you and, and you can do your best not to surprise them with change is what she says. The fourth one is everything's, or maybe the fifth one, I don't have numbers on mine. Number four is everything seems different. Everything just seems different. You ever heard people say that? As a pastor, I've heard that many times. Usually with a really whiny voice. I don't know, everything just seems different. Yes. Everything is going to get different. That is, that is part of the movement. That is part of the change. That is part of the growth. The next one is loss of face. 
<laughs> loss of face. In other words, embarrassment. Or somebody, you know, they're afraid they're, when something changes, they're afraid what they were doing becomes obsolete and then they get embarrassed because what they were really for is now has to be different and now they're gonna be maybe ashamed. We gotta, we gotta, as Christians, I think this is really important. We celebrate what God has done in the past and we are really open to what he's gonna do in the future. But so often we get stuck in the past and we're not willing to move forward. That's how churches die, by the way. That's how you get large edifices, old, old churches with a few old people in it. Refusal to change. There's concerns about competence, right? Everybody wants to be competent. I don't, I don't want, I wanna make sure that I have what I need. There's more work. You know, change means more work. I can tell you, going through this construction process in this building, and our, we've been trying to have church here without indoor bathrooms. What are we doing? And every week, there's all these changes inside this room, and all the admin people, all the operations people, all the teams, it's like chaos for them. And it's just like, oh great, here we go. You making a decision, we're gonna change this. It's gonna be more work for me. <laughs> Isn't that why we resist it? We resist the change. Ripple effects is another one she says. Ripple effects, it just, there's stuff that goes out that you know, you know what's gonna happen if you do this, then there's gonna be this, 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 this. Yes, that is part of change. So we've gotta figure out how to make sure that we see forward far enough to compensate for the ripple effects of the changes we're making, and good leaders do that. Past resentments is another resistant, and another resistor to change. Past resentments mean, um, oh, I've seen this before. <laughs> like, I've seen this happen. Our past comes back to haunt us, and we, we have like a trigger, and, and the boss says something, and we think we're gonna get hurt. And then finally, number 10, sometimes the threat is real. Like change is here, and it's really hard. Yeah. And it's really challenging. Today I want to tell you, it's kind of our last in the series of Summer at One Chapel, our last one-off series. Next week we'll start talking about prayer, and we'll start forecasting into the, the fall. But I want to talk to you about the, the reality of change, the reality of our season, the reality of how we should deal with seasons when they come. And I want, I want to help you see that we have a loving creator that we serve that built change and seasons into the very fabric of our world. If you look at Genesis 1.14, God said, let, this, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them, be, be, let them be signs to mark the seasons, the days, and the years. The very fabric of our lives revolve around what's going on in our planet and in our universe, and there is a movement, there is a movement of the sun and the moon and the stars as the planet Earth spins and we experience this seasonal dynamic of days, of weeks, and months, and years. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. God's creation is based on seasons. Our, our struggle is... Um, some seasons we don't like. Everybody loves the summer. Fall's pretty good in Austin, Texas. It's probably my favorite season, right? And if the fall is, is it gets cooler about December and um, <laughs> people don't like winter. A lot of people hate summer in Austin, Texas. We don't live in an agricultural society now, so we don't have an appreciation for this as much as we used to. 
as people, but seed time and harvest is a big subject in the scriptures that illustrates the seasonal nature of our world and, and plants come up and they die and they, 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 seeds are planted and then, and then they come up and they bloom and they produce fruit and, and then there, it's just this process over and over and over again that happens in our world. And I, I, I mean, my, really, as a person who really doesn't have anything to do with agricultural things, I've never farmed, I've never, I mean, I, the, my, my most poignant example of this <laughs> are the weeds in my yard. <laughs> the weeds don't go away. I mean, I do everything to kill them. I pull them, I get rid of them, and then just within a few short weeks, there they are again. I mean, I, some of you are going to be really mad at me, but I've used the bad stuff. <laughs> Tried to kill them, and still they come back. It's, it's in the fabric of our planet, of our world. We have to cooperate with the season. We can't long for the season of the past. We can't be so frustrated with our current season and always looking ahead and miss what God is doing now. We have to really see it, what God is doing in this season. I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with me that we've had a challenge in a couple of years. You've walked through a bunch of stuff. Look at how the Apostle Paul describes these seasons of struggle. Romans 5, 2 through 5, it says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our, you wanna read the word? Say it out loud. Say it out loud. Say it again. I know, you've been taught for a long time that Christians don't suffer. It's inaccurate. It's inaccurate. We live in this world, and what we have is this beautiful loving Heavenly Father who gave us Jesus that shows us how to live and he, he set up the life that we live with the Holy Spirit who whispers to us and comforts us and strengthens us. This last week I was listening to the Bible. Um, I don't think it was the Daily Bible reading. I was listening to it in another passage and in Acts 9.31 there's this phrase and it got me and I've been thinking about it since. And it's this phrase Right in the middle of all the persecution of the Christians, Stephen, it's around where Stephen gets stoned and he's, and he's not stoned, but st- killed. And he, and, and, and he is, and, and, and there's, there's this process where the, the persecution of the church starts to grow and in Acts 9.31, it talks about how they made it through it and there's this phrase and it says they lived, the believers lived in the fear of of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. God has a way that he wants us to live here and I think it has something to do with the fear of the Lord. In other words, the fear of the Lord means reverence, it means respect, it means believing he's in charge. It means saying, yes, I'm gonna do what you want me to do because I believe you know better than me. That's what the fear of the Lord is. And and when you live like that, I'm convinced you get to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The comfort, the peace, the strength. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings in verse three because we know that suffering produces, oh, another really hard word to say. Verse four says perseverance, character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I wanna highlight for you there are two general seasons we end up living in. One is, I would call it a season of surrender where it's really hard to give up. And in in reality, surrender is probably one of the best descriptions of our lives as we go through it, is there's always going to be a moment where you have to surrender when you don't want to. It's easy to surrender when you want to. You know, like, like, like we just did a bunch of 
vacationing with our kids and when you just get to play all the time, it's like, <laughs> I can surrender to that. <laughs> That's awesome. My kids are like totally into it. But as soon as I ask, okay, this week we gotta mow the lawn. Dad. <laughs> oh, it's okay. This is what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23. He said, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. We don't ever surrender once. This is a misnomer in, in Christianity. Oh, I gave my life to Jesus 32 years ago. No, you gave your life to Jesus and then you woke up the next day <laughs> and had to do it again. This is the calling, and, and listen, this is, the, this, is the, this is the truth of it. That sounds like bad news. The good news is when you do that, when you wake up the next day and say, God, I'm gonna give you everything and I'm gonna yield and I'm gonna surrender to you, then resurrection life and power starts to fill you. It's the only way you get resurrection is if you choose to die. You choose to yield, you choose to surrender. That's how, that's how Holy Spirit power starts to live inside of you. We have gotta surrender daily, weekly, monthly, seasonally, yearly. I think there are seasons that we come up on together as a church where we're gonna to have to like, oh, we gotta make some hard decisions here. How does this work? That was not lightning, it was just a little flash. <laughs> but you guys were really on it because all of you were like, Did you ever live, did you, did you, ever, did you ever think about how you live your life and you go through it for a while and you really work on something? Like when I was in college, I recognized how selfish I was. And I, I had a roommate and he was a pretty good roommate, but I, was, I think I was pretty selfish. And we had a lot of this, and it was just weird. So I, had, so I started to, okay, I've gotta, I gotta work on my selfishness. So I started doing better, started trying to read my Bible every day and try to pray for him and, and just try to do better. And, 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 I, and I did. I, I, I think I kind of yielded a, a, some selfishness in that season of my life in college. And then I thought, I'm pretty good. And, I, and, and then something happened. I got married. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was really selfish again. So I'm like, okay, I gotta read some books. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta understand how marriage works. I gotta, I gotta really, we, my wife and I, Amy, I mean, she is the sweetest thing ever. And she, I mean, she was way nicer to me than I was to her. And I had to really work. So I worked on it, surrendered, yielded, asked God to work in me. And I think I became a pretty good husband. And then something happened. I had kids. <laughs> and then I was really selfish again. What I'm telling you is we have to decide in every season how we're gonna live. You have to decide in every season how you're really gonna live. And many times it requires, and so it kind of goes like this, like, man, I've been working on this for a long time and I just kept, That's the work of God is very often seasonal and cyclical. Just like the weeds come up, you gotta go back and pull them. And I think we are in a season where we're all realizing maybe how selfish we are. The pandemic kinda did that. For a while we were super fearful. And they were like, no! <laughs> I'm gonna overcome! And then it dragged on. And then there was a few other political things going on in our culture and we just couldn't, like, we couldn't handle it. And we get angry and we get upset and then we start to lose our way of what, what Jesus is doing in our lives. We start to get fixated on certain little things and pretty soon we're myopic in our view of life and we're, I just wanna encourage you as we start to climb out of where we've been the last 18 months to two years, I wanna encourage you to decide once again who you're going to be, who God wants you to be. That's part of 21 days of prayer.
That's part of all of us getting into this position of getting on our knees, of submitting to God's journey for us, and being willing to yield to him in a season of surrender. Now, the second area is a season of stewardship, which I think happens a lot of times when th- life is good. It, life is, have you, have you ever had a really good season in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, okay, so everybody's like, ha, this is an awesome season. You know what we tend to do during that season? Nothing. This is awesome, life's great, this is so amazing. I don't know what's wrong with those people, sheesh. When life is good, sometimes we choose not to invest in the very things that make us who we are. We just kinda go along, because it's easy and it's fun. We're on summer vacation. Here's what Jesus said in John 15, one through five, he says, I'm the true vine and my father's a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he, this is so weird. So wait, he cuts off the ones that don't bear fruit, and then the ones that do bear fruit, he just hurts them a little. (laughs) I gotta tell you, I don't love that. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. He tells his disciples, look, you're in, you're on, you're in me, I'm in you. This is where you gotta start everything from. Stay right here. And then in verse four, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. So often we find ourselves season to season leaning out or leaning in. Leaning out, leaning in, Lean, and, we, and, and instead, of our, we're, uh, instead of our walk with God being steady through every season, we're like this. It's like a roller coaster, but a lot worse. You don't love it. You struggle, you wrestle. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I think it's pretty clear that the church, Big C Church, has been pruned in our country. The national statistics, here's here's what they are generally. I'm gonna share some of this as we go into the fall. National statistics, somewhere around 60% 60 to 70%, somewhere in there, of people who attended church before the pandemic will come back, or have come back. About 20% said, I love this online thing. I'm gonna keep eating pancakes at church. (laughs) And I gotta say, I loved it too. And that's why we're trying to do a really good job at making sure that there's an online community and we're not doing a great job yet, but it is in our vision, it is in our future, and I think we will do a better job in that world. And then there's 20%, 60, about 60, who will come back, who are gonna kind of make it back, 20% who will maybe stay in the online world, and 20% who just simply walked away. They're gone. They were already on the fringe or they, real, or they decided, and these are national statistics. This is not a one chapel thing, this is not a, you know, you, you look at the national Barna statistics, Pew Research has done it, and they all land about here. 20% just said, meh, I don't need it. The pruning is painful at times, but the purpose is more fruit. More fruit, more fruit. Jesus is saying remain in me during this season. There's more fruit ahead if you will just be steady. Seasons, sadly, often last longer than we want them to. Not the good ones, those are surprisingly quick. But the, the really bad ones, they seem to last longer than we think they should and I, can, I confess to you, that's how I feel as a pastor right now. I feel like this season has been way longer than it should be. It's really hard to figure out how to 
serve people where they're at, trying to make sure that we can move forward in people growing spiritually during this season and not get distracted from the most important thing that we're all about. It's interesting when you think about the harvest process though. Here it is. The harvest process. Number one, you prepare the soil. You get it ready, you dig down. I learned this from the guy at Lowe's. Um, (laughs) You prepare the soil. Number two, you plant the seed. I always love the soil getting ready and the planting of the seed. I just did it in my two front flower pots on my porch and I I did it this last week and I dug it down and there's so much action and activity. I love it as you put the seeds up. And then you water it and you feed and fertilize the seed and sometimes I remember being in kindergarten, you know when you, the styrofoam cup and the little seed, did you guys all do that? And you're just like, where is it? And like three days went by, it's dead, it's not gonna be here. No, fourth day, fifth day, sixth, it's little seedling comes up, it's like yes. Little known fact, part of the harvest process, number four, wait. That's a bummer. Wait. No, I wanna run around, I wanna do something. I wanna get something done. I wanna make something happen. And, and sometimes change is painful enough that people react. I was cutting some bushes this week and I was, I was cutting and, and cutting them back. I didn't notice that there was a, a bee uh, hive in the bushes. I didn't see it. So I'm just like and all of a sudden on my arm, I like and I was like, so, so I had the instantaneous reaction to bees. It's the international instantaneous reaction to all bees. You know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> and then I was, and then I stopped and I was like, did anyone see me? <laughs> I feel like, I feel like sometimes, I feel like sometimes, listen, we react to change, we react to what's going on, we react to the politics, we react to the, to the pandemic, we react to the things that go on in our lives, we react to our family members. It's like, get that pain away from me. I, I think there's a waiting that we've gotta get in touch with that is a deep work that God is doing through a longer season. And if we'll embrace that kind of thinking, if we'll embrace that kind of seasonal imagery in our church, I think we will be healthier together. We'll stay more steady during the up seasons and the down seasons. And we will, we will see the fifth step, which is the harvest. Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction, whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Verse nine, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Here's what I wanna tell you. God is trying to lead you and me through seasons. That's what he wants. God's leading us through seasons, but the enemy wants us to give up in the middle of that hardest season. He wants us to give up. And here's the lie. Here's the lie he uses. The lie is, this season's never gonna end. This is just the way it is. It's the way it's always gonna be. Could I encourage you not to believe the lie? 
I want the band to come up and we're gonna finish with a, with a song here and we're just gonna worship for a moment. Could I encourage you not to believe the lie that this season will never end? It's not true. It's a, it's a complete lie. And here's the thing. Look at me. Don't look at the band. Look at me. <laughs> here's the thing. When it's a season of surrender, it's really hard, right? Like, like that's when we want to quit and, and we want to give up and we want to say, forget this. This, is, this, this stinks. I don't want to do this. And we give up. But in the, other, the flip side, the other season that some of you are in, a season of stewardship where things are going well and things are on track and you feel a certain amount of hope and faith and joy, then so, something happens in that season too. Instead of preparing for the next season, you squander it. Don't squander any season. Don't squander the awesome blessings that God has given you. And very often these two seasons kind of move side by side in different areas of our lives. I, I know that happens. It's not like everything's bad and one, in, or everything's good. It's like there's these dual tracks that go on in your life and in one area you're having to surrender, in another area you're having to be a really good faithful steward of what God is doing in your life. And that means in every season you and I have to prepare for the next one. This is the fundamental point of this message. Every season demands you preparing yourself for the next one. Every season demands that you don't just see it as this isolated incident, but that there's something next. And if you'll look, if you'll lift your eyes, if you'll look to the fields that are ripe, Jesus says, if you will move forward steadily and consistently towards the next season because you see, Lord, in this season what the Lord is doing and you're willing to prepare and be faithful and be consistent in what's happening now, but you know why, because there's another season coming. You don't have to give up. You don't have to give up now. A new season will come to you. And in this season right now, let's dig in. That's what this 21 days of prayer is all about. 